not everyone's always right. No one's always right all the time. So therefore, it's really, really important that you listen to as many people as possible and you speak to as many people as possible because without having all of those ideas, then you're always going to make mistakes. Uh, we're obviously back uh, podcasting. We've got a series that's going to be released over the course of the next few weeks with lots of different guests. Um, one of the guests, amazing, Jack Sullivan, who is managing director of West Ham Ladies Team, 19 years old, BBC documentary star. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a documentary that you know we've just been talking about and I've, I've really enjoyed watching in the last few weeks. And I just said to you there, like the person who I think you know aside from you and, and the girls who've come across great your dad's come across brilliantly and he's obviously a very high profile figure in sport and in, and in football in particular what's your relationship with him been like first of all in your childhood growing up mm-hmm. as an inspiration but also now your on-screen relationship and now the fact that you've effectively worked for him too um i think since since we've been really young dad's always let us um have that have that relationship and be really really superly involved in everything he does um i think he thought the best way for us to learn was to watch him and uh see what he does what he does right and what we would do in his position um and make decisions make our own decisions on his decisions um and and i think that gave me and david my brother it gave us that sort of license of if we ever if we ever had to, or we, we, we would be able to make our own minds up and have our own opinions. Um, and he believes in not everyone's always right. Yeah. No one's always right all the time. So therefore, it's really, really important that you listen to as many people as possible and you speak to as many people as possible because without having all of those ideas, then you're always going to make mistakes. Um, and even when you have all of those ideas, you're going to make mistakes. Um, so I think since I've been young, I've I've always gone to the, gone to the football with him, and and it's always been something that's been really really important, as part of, uh, the family and and the I suppose the family culture within our household is is always been, predominantly football, mm. um, and, and we've always learned about the football. And the the thing with the football is it's like, ten different businesses rolled into one, of where you have a marketing department, you have a corporate sales department, you have a ticketing department where. You, you have um, a commercial department, hospitality. So you have that all rolled yeah. into one, um, which is something that is completely different to lots of other businesses. So it gives you a, a way of gauging knowledge in lots of different sectors. Um, but yeah, no, I th- the, the relationship with him, and it's been nice to, to see that on on screen with, with the documentary um, where we've been able to, where maybe the supporters of, of the of the football club and supporters in general of football have been able to see him in a in a bit more of a, a, a relaxed light um, at, at home as well because cause he is funny but um, I think um, you don't always see that when you see him at, uh, at face value but maybe the documentary where it's a bit more relaxed you see you see a different side to him it's also because he's not the f- not the star right he's not having to play up to the camera because it's not following Mm -hmm. him and I think it also goes to show that he is passing quite a lot of responsibility to you because he's like look it's it's my son who's doing this and I'm going to be seen to give him advice but that's it I think he loves the women the women's side he absolutely loves because it's like a mini West Ham yeah Uh, so where he can like he'll ask for the well we're off to Wembley on Saturday and and he'll ask for the ticket updates like four times a day because he likes to see if this tweet's worked, if this advert's worked, if, yeah, if yeah. this has worked. So he likes to micromanage that side. So I think for, for him, it's been really exciting to watch something grow from very little to, to something massive um, within, in the space of a year. So, so he's loved that side. But yeah, no, as you said, I think he thinks the best way for me to learn is, is to make mistakes and, and where he can, he can guide me. But... At the same time, we're not always going to agree on things, and mm-hmm. this is my my project at, at the football club. So therefore, he's got to he's got to listen to me, and and um, and I think the documentary's been really really lucky this year because no one's had access to Dad this year. He's 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 really shut himself off to all of the press on on that side of things, and 
and the documentaries, I think they've shown him in a different light um, and in a bit more relaxed, non, non-working non environment um, of where of where we're doing something really, really positive as well, which is, which is brilliant. I'm pushing something that's, you know, so popular and in such a positive year for women's football with the World Cup as well. Like it's, it, the, all the timing works out perfectly and the fact that they couldn't have written a better script that you go from um, starting a new job to finishing the whole season at Wembley for the, for the Women's FA Cup final. Like it's, it's stuff of TV series and movies, right? And, you know, if you end up winning that, that trophy and, you know, we'll be releasing this podcast before, uh, after it, but we're recording it before. But if you go on and, and lift that trophy, which I, you know, um, hope you guys do, it will be an amazing, amazing story. And also for you in 10 years time to look back on what you achieved in that season, right? Yeah, I think the documentary is, is interesting because the documentary is going to be brilliant for when I'm like 40. Yeah. <laughs> to be able to rewatch and to realise how stupid I was. Um, but no, I think it's that's going to be unbelievable. And, and to be able to capture that um, as a story, I think, has been has been brilliant. And I have to take my hat off to Curious Films, who the production company who put it together, and and they they came to us with the idea, um, and and they were starting up as well at the time that okay. they both left. Um, they both left Sun Dog, and um, they they moved on to to do their own business. And and for me, it was it was really I was really keen to work with maybe a smaller smaller type production company because they could really be on the ground and really make sure that it was everything that they wanted it to be and everything we wanted it to be. Um, and and I think, as you said, the story is, is unbelievable and, and that's something we're so, so proud of that, that we've been able to manage to, to get to Wembley and it was funny at the, not at the start, but to like towards the middle of the year, they were joking about get to the FA Cup final, get to the FA Cup final and it has actually happened and, and the dream ending, which was uh, the semi-final, which was penalties and, yep. and all like, of that. It literally, it's written, yeah. right? And then we've obviously got there and now the dream ending is, is, is at Wembley where, to be honest, I said at the time, the girls took an incredible gamble on us as well and so did the team, so did the staff. Um, we were completely brand new and, and hopefully we can sit there at the end of the year and say, well, your gamble paid off. We, we, we got to Wembley. Yep. And it's interesting, we took three girls from Chelsea and they've been there they've been to Wembley the last three years and this year they're not they're not there so um, yeah, and we awesome. are so yeah. it's absolutely brilliant I think what you said earlier was really interesting about kind of surrounding yourself with the right people and I think it's good and and it shows a lot of self-awareness from yourself and probably a lot that you've learned from your dad as well um, that you need to surround yourself with great people and I think we've just got uh, in terms of the release of the series so far we've got up to see episode six seven mm-hmm. um and we've seen you replace like the general manager of of the of the team um due to unforeseen circumstances and we've got this new guy in and um we also seen lots of other people that, that surround you and give you advice like how important has that been for your what is essentially your first job as well yeah i think I'm very lucky because at the football club we've got a real brilliant um, set up saying that we're really proud of it at the football club. We've had lots of staff that have worked with us for a long time, mm-hmm. um, which we think is really important because they build that sort of loyalty to, towards the football club. Um, and where we're slightly different to, to lots of other women's teams is they're all very much ingrained into the women's. They're all very keen to watch the women's grow. Um, so therefore, before I make a decision, I like to check with lots of lots of people to, to make sure that, firstly, have their opinion on it, see if it's the it's the right decision, and then, on a on a broader sense, away from the football club, as you said, it, it's it's important to to be with people that you know are going to be really honest with you, that are going to if they think it's a bad idea, they they're going to tell you, and then, and then it's up to you to to, to make those decisions, like. You, you guys, you, you've expanded massively and there'll be some people who have given you great ideas. Somebody was told it would never work. Mm. And it's trying to stay with those people that, that you trust um, and, and and to people that believe in you as well um, and support you through, through thick and thin as well. There may have been times where things don't go your way, but those people really support you even if it's, if it's not going your way. And do you report directly into the board of the, of the club? Yeah, so I'm lucky. I go home <laughs> yeah. to to uh, 
to, to the chairman every, every single night. But so. in terms of the formal side of things, do you still have to present like quarterly update? Like so it's, it's it's reasonably relaxed. I'm, I'm very lucky in, on that side of things. Um, there is a board meeting, so they have a board meeting monthly. Um, but I'm reasonably relaxed because dad can go and speak about that. Because he knows <laughs> he, that. Right? He knows, yeah. So I, I speak to him and I speak to him about once a w- Well, I speak to him a lot off off the wall a lot of the time but more formally probably once a week okay. um and um and it's it's obviously good because he he believes in the project and and that's what's been massive for us as a as a football club when when you've got the the person at the top of the tree believing in in the in the project it's it's been brilliant and that's allowed us to to increase our attendances 112 percent this year it's allowed us to um bring in a lot more commercial revenue than than, than ever ever before and and I think without having that belief from the top and a belief in in what you're uh, what you're giving to people, um, then how can you sell something that you don't believe in? You know. Yeah, I think w- what's really interesting you talk about there about belief and that's what's helped you push forward all these new revenue streams and obviously attendance is massively up. Um, but I also think seeing it with fresh eyes. I think the fact that you are 19 and and you're seeing things for what they are and what the next generation of fans are going to want because let's be honest the women's game is going to have the next generation of fans it's the the men's game is in a point where they they've still got the old set of fans you've got the average age of a of attendee is probably mid 30s 40s maybe 50s um and I don't know the average age of a women's um fan but I'm sure you see a lot of young people go to go to the games and the fact that you're young yourself you can see what is required you know again I, i'm talking about the documentary but seeing working uh, and engaging the fans in the club shop and things like that like that's smart that's utilizing assets in a smart way that engage with the fans better than most men's teams do because you're seeing it with fresh eyes and i think that's a really important yeah thing. i think at west ham we're, we're slightly we've, we've got the cheaper scenes it's for children so we've seen a big uptake in that we've still got seen seats for children for, for 99 pounds still so we we believe as a football club it's really important for, for that younger generation to, to come on board with us um and we want those younger generations to, to really to really support West Ham as, as as their as their first club and and we we think it's we think that's really important and as you said it's important to young people and and people with new ideas bright ideas bold ideas that that can um that can come and come and drum those home and and it's important that you use all the assets you have like we've got 20 in the women's side we've got 20 professional footballers yeah and that's something we should be really really proud of um and then the, and we also have a flourishing men's team as well so or, or any way and any way to to gather attention to, to the women such as the documentary or anything like that we, we need to be really really proud of what we what we have and shout it from the rooftops as much as possible we've let 2,000 local um, we've given away 2,000 tickets to local schools on the, on the women's side this year Great. to try and engage that younger generation and, and to and to get them into playing football as well as, as much as anything else you have this cliche where lots of kids these days play video games play this play that but there's been so much so much done about p- kids playing football how it benefits them mentally and physically mm. um and that as a as a club we have a social responsibility to our supporters to our maybe not even our supporters but to our local community yep. that we have to ensure that we have to better our local community because we want at when the club flourishes we want the local community to flourish as well and and the women's is a is a brilliant aspect in in doing that of where maybe young girls never thought they could become professional footballers but now they can sit down and say you know what, I can become a professional footballer. Yeah, I think that's that's totally fair. Um, what I'm really interested in, you know, we're both young guys, sorry, we're both running businesses, but I'm really interested in your upbringing. You know, it's different to most kids. Mm-hmm. Um, really interested in going right the way back and working out where your first inspirations were. You know, obviously your dad's owned football clubs for a long time, but when was it you first realised and at what point did you realise that running a football club was what you wanted to do? You wanted to emulate what he did? Like, was there a moment where you went, wow, that's that's it, that's that's what I've always wanted to do? Because your brother didn't want to do that. That's quite clear. Um, it's an interesting one because until I was about 
um, eight or nine, I wasn't that interested in football. Okay. Um, so it was one of those. And then I watched the World Cup and I became hooked. S- Germany. Germany 2006. Yeah, 2006. So I would have been six at the time. Um, and I was absolutely hooked um, off the back of that. And, um, because and then of the England team, because of the... I, d- I think it's just the whole occasion. Okay. And this is what I'm trying to tell the FA at the moment, because I think the big, those big occasions at Wembley, those big, where they, the whole yeah, look, generation, where the whole country gets swept well, look up at, Look something. at the World Cup this year. We got to the semi-final. <laughs> that, and it will always be burned into my brain, that Trippier free kick, right? It will always yeah, be yeah. that. Even if we lost, like, I, don't, I, I genuinely cannot remember how Croatia scored the goals. All I remember is Trippier, Trippier putting yeah. it in the top corner. That's it. I, in my head, we won that match. <laughs> I, I'm so positively impacted by that game, despite I, we lost 2-1. And I think you saw like the whole country was swept up by it as well, that w- whole country of World Cup fever. And, and that's something that football can do. Yep. And it can really... Where obviously you, we had a tough year as a country with... I'll go a bit political, a bit yeah, like yeah, Brexit, no, right. all of that. And where the World Cup really brought England as a, as a country t- together and... I remember it was one of those things where I was in the high part with thirty thousand other people when the when the trivia kick free kick went in and I think to have that you one of the beers that flew <laughs> up in the air, right? <laughs> I was actually getting the beers at the time. I missed the <laughs> really? Yeah, oh shocking. god. Um and then um but it's it's one of those things where I think it's it's brilliant that where you can have that sort of you have that whole country and it's the same with the football club as well, where every Saturday you can have sixty thousand people. Mm go in to a stadium and have the most unbelievable time well, and me- memories that are going to last in the rest we'll of the We look at lives. Liverpool this season, right? I'm a Liverpool fan and going through the mid-2000s and such, oh, well, post-Champions League win, 2005, a, a, a club that lost a lot of fans um, mm-hmm. through poor managerial decisions, through um, disillusionment with the board and now we're back into a point where everyone believes and wants to be a part of the club again and are traveling you've got an amazing away support and all these different things i think yeah you're absolutely right football can change communities it can change lives and the women's game has got an opportunity this year more than anything else you know england are a, a, a in the favorites for, <laughs> for the world cup and that is incredibly exciting and if if we can wrap that all up and west ham win the fa cup you know that's that's a great story for for women's football in the uk um but why why was it you, out of the two brothers, that decided to go into football and, and, and not your, not your old? Because you're the younger one, right? Yeah. Um, Dave still is really interested in football. Um, Dave loves loves the football. He comes to every single game uh, on on the men's side. He's, he's come to a few of the women's, but we've lost everyone. So oh, yeah, he's, he's half he's, not allowed, he's right? half banned at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's definitely not going to Wembley. <laughs> I think he's he's going to Southampton and then he's staying in the car for drawing. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. And he's like, if we, if if you're drawing, I'm not going in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're winning, I'm definitely not going in. No. Um, so uh, d- I I just think people develop at different times, and yeah. and the opportunity came up for me that I was really interested in going into the the women's side. Um, Dave's Dave's got lots of brilliant ideas, and he's and I think at some point an opportunity will come up for Dave that that he'll be able to jump and jump at and be able to really strive at mm. he's working at the moment but obviously with with what i'm doing and, and getting to wembley and, and the success and whilst we're trying to grow publicity for 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 the women's team I, i've been front of center of that but don't worry about dave he's he's, he's doing all right and he's, he's yeah working no hard. I, it's yeah, more yeah. of a it's more of a why you know and, and I, I completely understand what you're saying like it's, it's timing and opportunity mm-hmm. and it's just it's so interesting that you were the one who saw that opportunity and had that opportunity even though you're the younger brother um but what was it what was it like going through school and going through your childhood with your dad being who he was and you know obviously being pretty public a pretty big public figure at that time as well and you know you're a young guy and i'm sure there was there were certain moments during West Ham's rise, West Ham's fall, um, the, and, and Birmingham as well, where it wasn't such a nice experience to be the son of a football owner because, like, everything with football, it's political and mm-hmm. there's fans that love you and then they hate you. It's so fickle. Um, and I'm sure you felt that as well, being the MD of the ladies, you feel the ups and the downs. But as a kid, it's much harder to, to deal with, right? 
Yeah, I think one thing you do get is you is you get quite thick skin. Yeah. Um, but then I spin the question back round and I say, well, if the supporters didn't care, would you want them? And you probably yeah. would say no. Oh, that's true, that's true. Uh, you'd, I think we've been at two football clubs, Birmingham and West Ham, with two sets of real passionate and real supporters that travel through thick and thin, work really hard and then spend a lot of money on, on, on their football clubs. Um, and that's something we're incredibly grateful for. And, and we want we want the supporters to, to, to be engaged and, and to be... Um, and and to to have an opinion and have a say and, and believe that their say's been been heard and, and been listened to, um, I think it's it's one of those things where obviously as you said it, it's well, especially when I was younger it, it's tough where you've you've seen things and when we got relegated at Birmingham they they invaded the pitch and it's it's hard to see that. Um, what's it like on what's it like at school on Monday morning? Because like it's it's difficult to see what's going on. Mm-hmm. Right, whilst it happens, and you know that your dad and your family is affected, but what's it like when your family aren't around you to protect you, and it's just you with your mates, and and you know, it's it's hard growing up, right? And anything that makes you different makes it even harder. I don't know. I I always used to, uh, I always used to really uh, be honest. The football was a massive part of my of my weekends, and then when I got back into school. It was. It, I always used to really. I always used to like football, and I had a good f- set of friends around me, um, where I was really, really lucky to to have them, and 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 I had. I to be honest, I had a real brilliant time, and wherever I could bring them to, to West Ham, I'd I had my, tenth, oh no, ninth birthday party where we were all mascots as well. So that's cool. Things like that, which which is wicked, and to be able to, and it's going to be funny because I was a mascot at twelve at, at Wembley. For oh, the wicked. playoff final, so it's going to be weird to go back and, so and to seven years ago. Yeah, yeah. So it's gonna, you're going to have all of that as well. So it's to to be honest, I I I had a love school and I, I actually had a really good time there. Um, and to be honest, I was quite lucky there wasn't well there was no Birmingham fans because I went to school in Essex. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I there was there was some West Ham fans, but to be honest, they were they were all pretty supportive. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, in terms of the opportunity, which you talked about a minute ago, about timing and the opportunity coming up, what, what is that and what did that opportunity look like, right? It's, you're talking about the fact that you have a lot of off-the-record conversations with your dad at home, as you'd expect. You know, and that's, in some ways, quite a nice thing because mm-hmm. there's quite a lot of father-son relationships in business of which they very much park the family stuff and the business stuff and then they're in two different places so it's, it's nice that you can have those sort of conversations at home but he's not the only person on the board he's not the only person who makes a decision not the only person I'm not saying not belittling the fact that he's making key decisions but there are lots of people that make decisions at that football club <laughs> um, how did that opportunity come up? Um, so I finished my work experience which you did uh, you did a shift basically at every yeah, single yeah. department that tore through that for, for starters I remember talking yeah, about that so um so yes, yeah, so I worked basically at every single department. So I was I was speaking to speaking to the journalist today about that as well. So it was one of those things where I worked everywhere from the ticket office, the club shop, the academy, uh, player liaison, um, where else? Retail, uh, corporate sales, marketing, media, warehouse. I remember you warehouse. Said. Yeah. So I worked literally every single department of the football club to to try and gauge an understanding. Um, and a grounding like that was smart from you and your dad to like go if he had a grand plan for where he wanted you to be then go go and do all the things that you need to see and go and do all the things where you go and see it right from the bottom and work out what people are going through as part of this football club in order to make it work yeah I think I think then as well you, you, you gain some sort of I think you gain a relationship with lots of people as well, and lots of people at the football club that are going to be able to. Well, they have helped me on the on the women's side, and 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 as I said earlier, I'm lucky enough we've been at the football club for eight years, so I built those relationships over eight years. But definitely that work experience was was an interesting side of things where you saw it from a different level, and and you saw um, you saw how things run, how you would personally run things, maybe slightly different. Um, you could speak to them and see where they thought things could things could be improved and yep. and that sort of thing. And the difference is when you're with them for an hour and when you're with them for two, three, four, five days, 
things slip out and, and you hear it's different like the, things. It's like mini secret millionaire, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where you just get sent in and you go like, right, work out what's going on. But in a nice way, you know. Like yeah, no, it was, it was, it, I have to say it was, it was, as a work experience, I think over that course of time, I learned an incredible amount. And I probably, at that point in time, knew more about the finer detail of the football club than, than probably most people there. Um, because I really knew lots of lots of little little things um i'm built up a lot of empathy for those people doing the jobs right not only relationships in order for you to be able to call favors and them to be able to call favors on you but understanding about what they go through the problems they have all the barriers all the things that you know you know we've got 100 people that sit in this office like if i went and sat in every single one of their shoes over the course of the next few weeks i'd learn a lot of things that i can probably help by just changing something tiny and go, wow, okay, that's the barrier you have to put up with every day. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that. We can change that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that was it. Um, and it was interesting to, to, to see that and to see those those barriers. And to, but to be honest, the biggest thing that I learned off the back of doing all that work experience was the football's a results-based business. Yeah. If you're winning games, things are a lot better if you lo- than if you're losing games. And you could be providing the best product in the world the best shirt in the world, the best whatever in the world. Yeah. But the bottom line is if you lose 5-0 on the weekend, it's going to be very hard to for someone to, 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 to buy it. In. And did you feel, do you, obviously you feel it in a business sense in terms of revenue and things like that, but did you did you feel it in terms of mood? And I suppose that goes for, uh, for you now on the women's side. Like, did you feel it and do you feel it on Monday morning from the h- every single person that's in the... In the club. Every single person at the football club cares about the result on the, the weekend. result on the weekend because that's what they all work towards. They all work towards the football club being the best it can be. And the best it can be is for it to be challenging in Champions League, uh winning cups. Winning cups, yeah. winning winning whatever it can. And I think on a Monday you see the complete different feel in the football club where we lose to if we win. If we win it's everyone's over the moon and, and you can really press on and do some brilliant stuff. You can do the goals you can show the goals you can do brilliant content around that you can have interviews around that etc etc and and the and the whole thing whole thing ticks and it's it's a lot more positive of a week but if you lose it it, it, the whole football club does suffer and they they do all care um do you feel like so sometimes when we have a bad week so something doesn't go quite to plan it's sometimes the most important weeks where you can reflect and go why did that happen and make huge positive step changes whereas when it's just going well you never really try and innovate because it's going well like it's the classic don't fix what's not broken Broken, yeah so do you feel like it's all obviously in football the more you win the better but sometimes in a football club going through bad times is a really from a business point of view is a really good way for you to go we need to change some things and these are the things we need to change and we need to change them fast I think it's where the football club's slightly different is you have two you have two sectors. You have the football, yep. and then you have the massive business behind the football. On pitch and off pitch. Yeah. yeah. Where I think lots of people just think there's about five people who work in the office and <laughs> it's it's all about on what happens on a on a weekend. Um so I think we use the summer for off business to uh like off the pitch. We use the summer to do like a review. Yep. Um, of, and that's what I'm going to do with the, with the women's this year as well, where we can sit down and we can make maybe bigger and bigger changes and do bigger things. And then um, you also, lots of things can go wrong on a match day. So you correct those at the end of every match day, try and make sure they're right for the next match day. Um, and, and that's how we, so a lot of things are done almost at the end of events, if that makes sense. So at the end of every match day, we'll, we'll look at everything and do that at the end of everything. And we'll end of every summer, then we, we overview everything. And then on the pitch, as you said, I suppose that's every single week you look at, OK, we can see the goal for set piece. How are we going to solve that type thing? But to be honest, I'm, the manager's probably better off to... I hope so. Speak about <laughs> that than me. I hope so. Um, in terms of goals for... Let's start with the team, right? So... Women's football is going from strength to strength. Um, it's going to be a huge change for women's football cut off the back of the um, the World Cup. We're going to expect to see women's football explode again, you mm-hmm. know, after such a success in the last World Cup, and then you know, continuing 
continuing as the WSL to really, really push forward, professionalizing the, uh, the, the industry as well. And you know, clubs like West Ham really, really pushing it forward and investing huge amounts of money into that side of things. And then the prominence of things like your documentary. Um, where is the women's game going and, what, and where does West Ham fit into that in the next couple of years? I think, as you saw, we we wanna we wanna be at the 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 for, forefront of that. Um, where I see it as we can win in lots of different ways. Um, whether that's having lots of people at the ground, that's that's a big win win for us. Um, whether that's winning matches, which is obviously the traditional footballing way of of, of being successful. Um, or whether that's inspiring younger younger girls to, to really participate and get involved with football, whether that's not personally being a footballer, mm. that could be doing some marketing within football, that could be doing some something commercial with inside football. There's lots of opportunities, and we've got Karen Brady at the football club who's a great ambassador for that, yep. of where she can showcase, and she's, a, she's living proof that that girls can be successful in, in football as well. Um, and I think for us, it's that's really important and, and there's lots of ways for us to win. So where do we fit? I think we fit in being in that top division. We want to have the one of the biggest supporters groups in, in that division of where if we're at home, we, we, we want to have one of the biggest crowds. Um, and then what I've always said is I think commercially we offer something completely different to lots of the other football clubs. Um, so, so therefore I want to be at the forefront of that, of where as, as, a, as a football club and as a women's football club, we have to be slightly different and we have to say, OK, well, we're not going to have the biggest budget through our men's club. So how do we have the, how do we get a bigger budget and whether that's, doing lots of stuff with commercial partners that, that they sit down at the end and they see re real value with that um, or whether that's um, whether that's doing things like the documentary as well where mm. it gives it gives us a lot of eyeballs and a, and a, and a lot of attention as well and, and for us it's, it's really really important that we, we make sure that the players are really happy they've got saying that they might not have a different club where they could grow their own personal brands alongside growing the football club um, and I think for us that's that's what's really important just having a think like let's say the BBC documentary doesn't get commissioned or you don't mm -hmm. decide to do it for a second season mm -hmm. um, you win the FA Cup why wouldn't you start the West Ham ladies channel on YouTube and do exactly the same thing um, that they've been doing daily like we do here right and like a few other people do and create your own value i think we've always said here the football club that daily vlogs the first it doesn't matter and sunderland proved this by and so did west ham ladies in some ways um doesn't matter what club you are it literally doesn't matter people are fascinated by how football clubs work so until someone does it daily might it, be an idea it's it's certainly you've kind of broken the barrier down um to go, it's possible. We can show what happens in the club. But why are we so scared about showing what happens at a football club? Like, you've shown transfers, you've shown um, commercial deals, you've shown on-pitch relationships, off-pitch relationships. Um, like, there's so much that you've been honest about, and you should be incredibly proud of that and proud of, proud of the transparency of the club that's allowed you to be, and also yourself. But it's like a huge springboard into we need to do this ourselves, and. Um, you know, talking about that digital and the commercialization of it, then the problem with the BBC is you can never commercialize that property. Whereas if you take it upon yourself, that becomes a whole new value proposition for, for brands. Is that something you'd ever consider? Or are you, are you looking to create other IP outside of what you've effectively got, which is stadium? Um, and we, I think we've discussed it before on the phone. The fact that effectively football clubs are now becoming media channels and it's about how we c you can best utilize the assets for, for brands and sponsorship and and personal brands as well i think we're always thinking and how we can develop and how we can improve um i think you've seen in the past five years if not 10 if not 20 where you've seen a complete and utter change in football mm -hmm. where 
the boards used to be static, now they're LED. Um, there's no branding on the sleeve until two years ago in the Premier League. Yep. And I think you're constantly seeing where a lot of the sponsorships have gone from traditional sponsorships of where they've been. You get a big sign here, you have the sign there, you have some LED down here. Yep. Where they've become, especially in the women's game more so, where they've become really activation-based and, yep. and how people work within those activations. Um, we believe that at the football club we're, we're, we're quite forward thinking uh, mm. compared to compared to most football clubs and and for us we, we want to be really at the forefront of everything like that so and we've just and it's one of those things where I think we're always looking to into new ideas and to be honest it, it might be one we should we should look into yeah and and it's it's about creating that additional IP right and uh, additional ways to sell to sponsors in a new and different way. Yeah. Um, and I think what we touched upon before the camera started rolling uh, is a lot of the success of your documentary and your personal success really has been the fact that people are buying into the personal story mm -hmm. and human stories sell more than anything else. That's why X Factor was so popular for so long. It's why I'm a Celeb so popular. It's why the Kardashians are so popular, right? It's because that show is just real life or it proposes to be. And you guys have done a very good job in, in putting that across. What would be fascinating to to hear is kind of what you expected, you what the expectation of was set at the start of the season compared to where you have managed to get it to, both commercially, which you've done a great job at, attendance, which has increased massively, but also on-pitch performance. I expect these weren't expected. They to were. the level. To I the really, they were. Really? Um, to be honest, I never set myself targets. Um, I set myself, I changed the target a lot. Yeah. So it'll be, get to this amount, then as soon as you get to that amount, yeah, yeah, that's good. Amount, that's amount, good. Amount. Make them so achievable, but... You're constantly pushing um, and you're constantly moving. Because um, I think if you set yourself a target and you get there within a month, then it's one of those where you just say, oh, well, I've got there. I was speaking to someone's business the other day and they were like, well, my uh, my salesman, every month, they don't work for the first two weeks and then the last two weeks when they realise they have to th hit their target, they work a lot harder. And I said, why don't you split the target in half and mm -hmm. say, okay, you've got to do this much on these two weeks, this much on this two weeks and see if they can do it. Because I think when you set a target, you have to have a mindset that if once you reach that, then you push on again, you push on again, you push on again. And that's how you really drive something. And really, and I've probably learned this from dad, and it's a bit annoying sometimes, but it's where you do something and you're never pleased with it. Mm. And whatever you do, you're always pushing on. You're always saying, okay, we can now do better. We've what's got next? there. What's next? And maybe not even what's next. Let's say we've got to a thousand people at the women's. Why are we not on one and a half thousand? It's one of those where you carry on pushing and, and driving forward. Um, and and I think then the whole football club starts to have that bug as well um, of where they know that they need to work hard and they need to push on, they need to push forward because, let's be honest, the fan experience can always be better. Yep. You can always have more people on, uh, on your social medias. You can always have more... Uh, always have better content. You can always do all of those things a lot better. It's um, so I think as a as a football club, we we need to we need to offer our our fans the best experience we can possibly do. And, and until we're there, which I'm not sure it will ever be, because as we said, there's always always way, ways to improve. Um, but I think when we when we looked at at the start of the year with the women's, we wanted to finish mid table, mm -hmm. which we've done. Um, to be honest, I'd prefer to finish fifth than seventh, but it's fine margins. And with the FA Cup run and a few other things, I think of course. we've uh, we, we've had to sacrifice things. Um, we always believed on our day we could beat anyone, and I think we've we're just about there of where we we really really can do that now. Um, Competitive. That's yeah, basically yeah. the yeah, target yeah. then. And then. Um, commercially, we, we've smashed this year and we, we need to continue. Where the women's game is different and it's it's annoying, but it's brilliant at the same time, is the goalposts are always moving mm. um, of where someone will do a deal and then three months later... You'll look back on that deal and yeah, go, oh, why yeah, do we do yeah. it at that value? Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those where 
Barclays was never around three months ago and no one was talking about Barclays three months ago and then Barclays signed to become the head sponsor of the Women's Super League. Yeah. And it's okay and it's like, well, that was never expected. And then it's one of those things where it's constantly changing and the ball game's constantly moving. I think we're in a similar position here, right? We're in a market in influencers, which if we look back a year, people weren't spending millions of pounds on influencer marketing and now they are. And we're like, wow, okay, you know, why do we do that deal? Two years ago, it makes no sense, but that's, it's perspective. The one thing that I do like with those ones though, is those people gambled with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure, they're and the best me, people. For me as a person, I sit there with the ones that I've done deals with before, and there's what Rich Henry was my first deal was when I was at the women's. And um, and I sit with them now, and I'd bend over backwards for them now, like I would with all my partners, but with them, especially because they, they took were my a punt. first ones, they took a punt, and it's paid off, and they've not only invested in the football club, but they've invested in me as a, as a person as well. I was I was the one who, who went and pitched it to them. And it was one of those things where I think that's what's really important for for us. And and it's brilliant to see them grow alongside you you growing as well. And and, and you must see it all the time where, where you do things. But that's how I'm just, that's how I justify it. And I go, well, these people were here at the, fir- at the start and they really backed us. Yeah. Um, which kind of leads us nicely onto where you want to be. I think it's it's pretty clear that and I'm obviously you know, we're in a position where the club is growing and and when I say the club I mean the ladies team and then obviously the the men's team is doing very well as well in the Premier League. Um, both teams can always do better until they win everything, um, and that's the that's going to always be the case with football. But where do you want to be? What do you actually want to do? You're 19. Um, you know, what, what does it look like when you're 29? Because still, then you've, you know, you've hardly started, and that's the beauty of starting so early. And the same thing I felt when mm-hmm. I was 18, 19. I'd already had a job for a few years, and I was earning decent money. And I'm like, hmm, this is pretty cool. But I'm like, wow, what am I? What am I going to be doing in, in 10 years' time? Because one, the world's going to change so much, and two, like the opportunities that are going to be around. Do you know me. what you wanted to do in 10 years' time? No, I had no idea, and I, I'd still, I'm, I'm not sure how I'd answer that question. Um, myself, I think when it comes to 10 years, I want to think about, start thinking about legacy, about what, what it looks like when I am not working anymore and what I've done, and I also want to look back on it and go, wow, I had a lot of fun. I did. I, I made the most of it whilst it was whilst it was good. Um, so I think that's kind of what I look back on it. And and if I look back on my last three years or four years, that's kind of what I would have wanted or said when I was 21. And I started this, and or when I was 20 and started this. And I, someone had asked me that question: Where do you want to be in five years? I would never have said how 120 people, four offices around the world, um, you know, multi multi million pound business. I would never have said that because it's just it's inconceivable, right? But I would have said that I want to work with people I love. I want to do things that I love. And I want to make the most of it whilst it's, whilst it's great. Um, but obviously there's, there's always those expectations and, those, and you said you don't make targets, but at the same time, there's always a North Star that you want to align yourself to. So what is that? I'll be honest, I, I take every day as it comes. I, I don't really know. Come on, you're better no, than that. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest. I, I, I feel like my journey with the women's is nowhere near over. Yeah, no, for um, sure. I feel like... That's well, you can make be, a name there, that's right? That's going to be something where I think, and not only a name, but as you said, a legacy. I think what we've done with the women's is where we've made them fully professional and, and something that happens with lots of women's teams is after a few years, they um, they different things happen and, and by the time you know it, they're nowhere near the team they, they once were. And, and for me, that's, that's something that I want to make sure doesn't happen. I want to make sure that by the time I leave... The club's in a happy place with with where it is. Sustainability. I'm in, I'm in a happy place with where it is, and and I can go and I can say, okay, look, I'm happy. If if there's ever any ever a problem, if there's any, if you ever need me, I'll probably still be around. Well, I will be around, um, and I'll be able to able to support. Um, but I don't think I'm anywhere near there at the moment. Um, and then I suppose going forward, I've I've always said, and I, I said to you the first time I met you. I just want to do things I really love and really enjoy. Um, and you're in a nice position, right? You, mm-hmm. you can, you're in a position where you can pick and choose kind of yeah. what you do. And 
and if that is something that's not as well paid but you love it that you're in a very fortunate yeah. position that you can do it um and i'd love to be in that that situation i would, I would love to own a restaurant yeah but i don't know nice. where but i think that would be something i'd really love to do but i don't know when that will happen but at some point that's something i'd want to really and do there'll as well. be no one there <laughs> yeah, nice time. yeah I, I really, I think I really want a restaurant. I, I grew up in restaurants from the age of like four uh, until the age of fifteen, sixteen, and there's nothing that there's nothing that will ground you as much as running owning a restaurant because mm-hmm. it's literally people through the door, and people enjoying what you give them, um, but also the stress and serving food at that level, at that quantity, at that uh, that quality consistently is very 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 tough in some ways like football right you've got to get people on the seat you've got to show them a product they enjoy and you've got to show them it every week this is like restaurants it's hard quite relentless a restaurant where it's every day yeah exactly like three times a day right? yeah exactly and and i think i'd quite like to do it myself um mainly because it would be full circle for my life um yeah. i'm not sure what and when um something where i could find someone to run it because i definitely wouldn't want to run it myself but i'd like I'll to own it same. And I'd love to go and take people to my restaurant. Agreed. Um, but yeah, that's that's an interesting one. So it, again, it's saying, well, I'd like, I think everything I want to do, I want to be seriously proud of as well. So where I could be there and my heart of hearts, I'm like, you know what, this is actually a wicked product and this is what we're actually offering people is wicked. Yeah. And I think that's that's what really strives me and, and things that where I can make a big difference as well. Um I think think that's that's really important. At the, at the women's, for example, we've moved so quickly, but I like that. I think that's important. I think if you if you're doing something and you're just plodding along, for me, I I couldn't wake up in the morning and, and do that. I would have no interest. Yeah. But it's nice to. Well, you're like so you young, guys, right? For example, you've 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 expanded dramatically. And Since I, I last saw you, we've yeah. grown by seventy people. And I think. It's incredible. And I think when you're waking up in the morning, you're doing that and you're waking up and you're seeing, oh, wow, you know, we're actually massive now. And it's like, that's incredible. Mm. And, to, and to, be, to be part of that, I think, is, is an incredible journey, not only for you, but for, for all the staff as well, to be part of something where they see, a, where they see growth, where they see, it's where everything's stagnant, where people are going to say, well, you know what, I think I can, I th- why am I here type thing. Do you ever get intimidated by the age thing? No. no. You? No, I don't think so. I never... They, every interview they ask me, but... Really? Yeah. I yeah, don't I think it's ever been a problem. Um, and you, you don't think it's a problem for anyone else? Have you ever had it as a problem? Yeah, I have, yeah. I'm not... Oh, I'm not naive enough to think that in my industry where I'm selling to people that age isn't a problem, especially the age of the people that sometimes I have to sell to or people I have to build relationships with, um, that sometimes age is a problem, either through jealousy sometimes, mm-hmm. um, or just the fact they just don't want to deal with a 20 year old. They want to deal with someone older. And that's kind of been the beauty of having two business partners that are older than me. Um, it's the fact that I don't have to be the guy, like I can be the guy. For certain people, I'm a much better person to deal with than, mm-hmm. than a 30, 35 year old. Um, because they want to be excited and want to see that someone's wh- who is the age they'd expect to be running an agency that doing what we're doing is mm-hmm. doing it. But at the same time, if we're dealing with huge corporates, huge brands like Coca-Colas and KFCs and uh, Lidl's and things like that, they, they don't necessarily want to deal with me. And that's fine. I can deal with that. Um, they aren't saying they don't want me to do it. They just don't want to be the... Per- I don't want to be the person that's talking to them then that's fine and that's deploying your assets in different ways um but it's becoming uh, obviously i'm getting older now um but it's becoming less of an issue the beard. the beard is important <laughs> um I have, ever since i was able to grow the beard when i was 17 it's just been a constant thing seven years just, I, it wouldn't matter if it was in fashion or not i'd still have it just because i look like a baby without it and i don't actually know what i look like without it now um and now the hair like it's a completely different color just kind of age me out slightly so just go gray <laughs> <laughs> um but I, before we wrap up like talk about the industry we're in um you're obviously very busy doing what you're doing but do you ever like first of all what do you do to relax and then we'll get on to what do you watch on youtube but 
What do you uh, What do you do to relax? Um, I spend a lot of time with friends. Uh, so whether that's um, I enjoy boxing. I okay. watch lots of boxing. Um, Watching or doing? No. Watch, watching. Watching. I <laughs> wouldn't enjoy getting punched in the face. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I, I really, I know, I really, really enjoy that. Um, and then spending time with friends after after you, I'm I'm off to watch the football with with a with a mate as well. Right. So, I think that's really important, and that that work life balance is so it's all very cringy, but no, no, it's true. Work, right? work life balance is is really is really really important, and and sometimes that can just be look going to a pub, and sometimes that can be doing something completely different. Um, but I think as as we said, surrounding yourself with, with good people that that you really like and and really trust is 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 really really important and and to be honest that's that's pretty much how how I relax as well. Do you get into the office early? Leave no, the office late? I'm, I leave the office late-ish, but what I would say is I don't think you really ever leave the office. If someone calls me at eleven o'clock at night, I pick up. Yeah, and that's where I think it's important. Where you might not be in necessarily the first person in. But you can work the hardest. Mm-hmm. My my dad, for example, he's, he worked from home his whole life. Um, That's a very nice position to be. Yeah, in. but it's it's one of those where he's come from absolutely nothing. So yeah, no, and I he think. works harder than anyone I know. He's he's replying to emails at one o'clock in the morning, mm. and that's where I look at him and I'm like, well, he's worked from home his whole life, but he works harder than anyone else I know. So it's one of those things where. I don't necessarily think you have to be in the office and that's where with a lot of my staff, if they're not in the office, I don't get super angry, but if I ring them and they don't pick up or if I email them and they don't reply for a long time, yeah, that's yeah. when I get more frustrated yeah, yeah. because it's, you could be in the office all day and write one email. It's if you're not in the office and you're writing 50 emails and then you're in the office for five, six, seven hours or you're out meeting people or whatever. It's, it, I think... Obviously, it depends what you do slightly, but I think all because you're in the office doesn't mean you're, you're necessarily working yeah. massively harder than, than someone else. L- last question um, about your, your relationship with your dad, just whilst it, it's just coming to my mm-hmm. head. Was there any point when you were talking about the opportunity that, to run the team where you thought, I don't want to do it for my dad's team? No. You thought that was, the, that was the answer? Like there was no part of you that thought, what, what if it goes completely wrong? No. That's interesting. I, uh, maybe naively, I never thought it would go wrong. Yeah. Um, I thought at the at, at the time, I've got an incredible set of people around me. Mm-hmm. I hope they wouldn't make me make <laughs> make the mistake. Yeah, no, that's fair. And also, he um, wouldn't, right? And he wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and where it was a massive opportunity for me to help grow the the family business and to to help grow something that that as a football club we could be we could be really proud of and and for that you know what and I hope we sit there as as a football club and we go well you know what that's been something we should be really proud of um and we've got the end of season awards on Wednesday and there's there's a there's a large amount on the on the women's team which which to be honest a few years ago was wasn't there and and I think for something like that is something we should really celebrate and be really proud of and hopefully touch wood even more we'll be able to uh, to take the FA Cup on stage as well that would be awesome <laughs> that would be awesome I've given you a few minutes to think about uh, what you watch on YouTube so yeah. yeah what what is it that you you watch online what do you what do you who do you follow on Instagram like what yeah. what is it that you enjoy when I'm quite boring content? so Jack mate I watch yeah, yeah. I know Jack yeah um, and he's a West Ham fan Spencer I watch because West Ham fan he's a West Ham fan as well um, and then I watch KSI, which I think everyone watches. Yeah. Um, so it's the cl- like the, the the classic. Creators. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, just just more more the classic people. Um, Will and E. Okay. Um, True Geordie. Yeah. So just all the all the boring classic people. Yeah. Obviously, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, no. To to be honest, I, I, I just I watch. I try and not take things too seriously, and I think. It's one of those things where maybe because I've been brought up in one of those environments of where since I've been very young, people have just taken the piss out of me or uh, written abuse or done anything. I very rarely get offended. 
Yeah. So I think that's why I like Jack really a lot. And uh, Brian and as Brian, well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause, because they don't really care. And I think possibly something as a, a culture, is, as a country we have now, I've gone completely off on a tangent, but as a culture we have is people are worried too much, people are scared, uh, scared too much. Yep. I think, and people are always scared to offend people and do this, but I think sometimes we need to just sit there and be like, well, you know what, like, let's let's really let's embrace like who we are and and let's just like it's just at the end of the day as they say six and stones will break your bones yeah. words will never hurt you and it's a, it's just a bit of banter at the end of the day sometimes yeah, yeah. um but yeah no especially on youtube they have that a lot on youtube they have where a lot. people really think they're this that and the other but anyway so i've gone completely off on the and what platform do you spend the most time on are you an instagram man um, Twitter was always your thing, right? Twitter um, is my biggest. Instagram, I probably look at the most. I've got a private Instagram um, yeah. that is probably my... Um, that I look at the most. Um, and then I've got a public one as well. Mate, it's been a pleasure to, to chat with you. Um, you've got a great story. You've What's so exciting for me is that your story's just begun and I'm delighted to be here like witnessing the start of it and, and also the start of West Ham Ladies and... Hopefully this weekend it will crown off in the first season with you guys um, being the FA Cup winners. And even if it doesn't, then I think you can still look back on it and be incredibly proud and build the building blocks uh, ahead. And the legacy you're talking about is something that I'm sure you're going to achieve and under the guidance of your dad as well. It's uh, it's a very, very exciting time to, to be you and be a part of women's football. So, yeah, you should be very proud. And um, thank you very much for, for watching. Thank you very much for listening to, to the podcast. We've got loads of guests coming up, um, loads of awesome guests coming up on the podcast in the next few weeks. Um, we're doing a job of kind of banking up the podcast that we've got to, to release loads over the course of every single week because we've been really, really bad over the last year or so of releasing podcasts so what we're going to do is we're going to bank up a few and this one this one might be the first it could be the second could be the third could be the fourth that goes out um and then we'll be releasing one a week every week um on the goat youtube channel and across uh, all the classic podcasting outlets apple music spotify who knows where it's going to go it's certainly not down to me where it goes um thanks very much for listening thanks very much for watching um and see you soon